Good morning. Good morning. Good to be in the Lord's house once again. We're going to go uh, real quickly some of the prayer requests that we have. I'm going to introduce you to our speaker for the day, and uh, we're going to start our camp meeting out today. Amen? Amen. Uh, of course, Kathy's here. She had a spill yesterday, so uh, broken bone, tibia, is that what it was? So anyway, she... She uh, fell a little bit yesterday, so she's here today, though. Thank God for that. And so let's pray for her, Brother Harvey Helm. Let's remember him. Made a bird. Jim and Maida are supposed to be on their way to church, so they're going to be able to come unless something happens. So let's remember her. Jim Hotelling's in the nursing home. Bill and Judy Turley. Let's remember Bill Hale, Gloria Taylor. Gloria Montgomery's supposed to come home today. And then Charlie's sick, and uh, so continue to pray for him, okay? We all have prayer requests, right? All right, let's pray, and then I'm going to introduce you to my friend and the preacher for the day, okay? But Father, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, for this camp meeting that we're about to enter into. We pray that you bless uh, and be with each speaker, each singer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that everything said and done will honor your son, Jesus. We ask it all in Christ's wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Notice in your bulletin, if you have your bulletin, after the uh, schedule of this week, it says, we would like to extend a warm welcome to Brother Church Trent. <laughs> who will bring... Amen. Amen. So I'm glad that his name is associated with the church. <laughs> so without any further ado, Brother Church, you come on up and uh, give us a message. Amen. So you went to church now? Yeah. Thank you. God bless you. I didn't know I was church, and I didn't know I was coming to church. Two blessings today. But I shake hands with some of you, and I appreciate Brother Jerry letting me come. And it's been a lot of years since I've been here. and uh, But I do appreciate him letting me come and be a part of this. And uh, got a beautiful, beautiful church here and uh, beautiful people. And now to get, <laughs> but uh, we're glad. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I really am, and uh, I appreciate it so much. I want you to take your Bible to the book of Isaiah, and uh, in a minute I'll share with you Isaiah chapter number one. Isaiah chapter number one. This being the Sunday school hour. I want to share with you some things this morning. But there's a specific statement. I believe that when God puts a statement in the Word, He does so with a reason. And I've found that when I study the words of the Bible, I'm amazed at how many times God will make a statement and it'll be just two or three times. But one statement from God is truth, and it'll always remain truth. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change any. If he said it one time, still authority. If he says it ten times, still authority. But I do want to show you something out of the book of Isaiah. And if you look, look in chapter number 1 and verse number 20, I want to, I want to read these just for a moment, and then I'm going to take you to, to, the, to the message but verse number 20 of Isaiah chapter 1 says, But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. Now here's the statement. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Whatever leads up to that statement that he makes, he is, he is saying that it is his word and is out of his mouth, and that's what it will be. The Lord hath spoken it. God's word, I don't know how you could go anywhere 
and get a more specific statement than this when it's talking about the mouth of the Lord. It's not man's words. It's not in concepts. It is made in words. I hope to get this across to you. So he said, if you refuse to rebel, it starts out. That whole chapter down through there shows a nation that is absolutely steeped in uh, rebellion, steeped in all kinds of of, uh, sins. He talks about the nation, sinful nation, and a country that is desolate. When I read Isaiah chapter number one, I see America. It's not hard to see what's happening in our country today. And so he says, if you refuse and rebel, but he always gives an opportunity to get right with God and get those sins forgiven. So here it is, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's a warning. Now look at Isaiah 40 and verse number 5. Isaiah 40 and verse number 5. Isaiah 40 and 5 says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What's he talking about here? It's the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he is coming at some time, and that will be in God's heart, not in our heart. We don't put dates to the time that the the Son of God is coming back again. So he says, The Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So that's a promise. I believe that. Now go to Isaiah 58, and look with me at verse 14. I bet you never heard anybody preach the whole book of... (laughs) of Isaiah in such a short time. But anyhow, Isaiah chapter 58 and verse number 14, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord. Do you see the progression that's going? He don't want you to refuse and rebel. He said, the Lord's coming. And he said, thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the, of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob of thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Here is a fulfillment. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. I would pray that every one of us has got, got to that point where we delight in the Lord. Where we come to church not out of uh, anything but desire. Amen. And come to the house of God. Why? Because we're here to worship this same God, this same Lord that we're reading about. And God said it's out of the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. All right? Now, I'm going to read you some scriptures, and we won't go to look at all of these, but there's some of them I, I will want you to see. But if you go to Acts now, chapter 4, I want to lay a foundation here. But Acts chapter number 4, and we're going to be looking at verse number 28. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 28. Here's what he says. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. God had determined before to be done. In other words, we're seeing here a time when God's going to say fulfillment of God's, we can call it a predetermined plan. I'm glad he initiated that. Then in You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 46 and 10, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, here's where I'm wanting to get to. In those two statements, predetermined is the word counsel. Counsel. Psalm, I want you to turn to this one, Psalm 33. I'm leading this up. I hope you hold on to it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The counselor is determined before to be done. And he says that my counselor shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. This is none other than God Almighty. This is the Lord. Psalm 33 and 11 says, The counsel, here it is again, of the Lord standeth forever. 
the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Now hold on to that thought, counsel. We've seen that word counsel three times now. And the counsel means a deliberate purpose. Deliberate purpose. When he talks about his counsel, it means a deliberate purpose. He has a design, a plan, an intent, a will. And all of that is in his counsel. So he has a deliberate purpose. These scriptures came into being to give us, and there's a scripture here I'll show you in a moment, but they come into being to give us his counsel. His counsel is a deliberate purpose. God has put this here in our hands because of a deliberate purpose. So he has a, he has a will behind that. He has a plan behind that. He has, he has a design behind that all in this book. If there's any one thing that we ought to have in our hands, it's the word of God. Yes, sir. Period. Amen. If there's any one thing we ought to base our life upon, it's the word of God. Because you cannot trust anything out there. Our government and all these other, they're so corrupt, I don't believe none of them. Yes, I'll say, I'll take this Bible and I'll believe it, and y'all can believe what you want to believe, but you're never going to convince me that there's any truth apart from what we have in the Word of God. Amen. The counsel of God is a deliberate purpose. So he has a purpose behind it. Now, the Bible is his words, all of these. I believe it all the way from the beginning to the end is his words. Amen. I have no problem doing that. But let me tell you what a word is. A word is a vehicle of thought. A vehicle of thought. So God puts his, when he told us down in uh, chapter 33, verse 11 of Psalms, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, his, and it says, the thoughts of his heart. Here we go. Now I'm getting to where I wanted to go. Vehicles of thought. God chose the words and his counsel, a deliberate purpose, and he loaded those words with the things that are in his heart. Amen. And he sent them to us. We have them right here. And they stand forever. Nothing changes. Now, being a vehicle of thought, the thoughts for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's good enough for me. Amen. If I want anybody to talk to me, I'd rather for God to talk to me than anybody else. I believe it. Vehicle of thought. Now, God's got a design, a purpose, a will behind this, in that deliberate purpose. Let me share something with you. God's got two desires as he sends you these vehicles of the thoughts of his heart, loaded them up in words and sent them to us. Here's what he wants to do with it. Two things. He wants to attract the mind. He will attract the mind. When you read that Bible, when you hear somebody preaching it and it is God's vehicles of thought, the words are, then he's sending that to you. He wants to absolutely get to a place where he attracts the mind. That's where it starts. But that's not where God wants to stop. He wants to attach the heart. He will attract the mind and then attach the heart. And I'll tell you one thing, God can do a good job at that. Amen. He does an excellent job at that. Bring it through the mind, put it into the heart. This is where God wants to go with what he, thoughts of his heart. He wants them in your heart. Are you all with me? Yes. Now, I'm going to give you three things when we're talking about the words of God, the vehicle of his thoughts, and what is accomplished. This book. First of all, there is an authority by the scriptures. An authority by the scriptures. I'm going to give you these. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 11. If there's any one verse of scripture, I want to encourage you to absolutely mark it down or, or put it somewhere where you can go back to it. Jeremiah 29 
and verse number 11. I did not see this until just recently. And I know I've read this. But scriptures have a tendency to do this. You read them the first time, they may not be a, a lot of projecting itself to you. But the next time you read it, something comes out of that scripture. And when you get that coming out of the scriptures, God has a purpose for you as an individual to get something out of that. So this came to me not too long ago. But Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thank God. Now here's the statement that stood out to me. To give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. God does not want you, when he gives you these words, out of his mouth, his heart, loaded up in the scriptures, then he said to give you an expected end. You don't have to live life without an expectation of the end. Now, I can't tell you when I'm going to die. I can't tell you a lot of things about that. But I knew well one thing, I've got an expected end. My wife went on to be with the Lord last May after 60 years of marriage. And I miss her terrible. Half of me's gone. But I do one thing. God's still sufficient. God's still good. And I do know this. To give you an expected end, my wife was saved two years before I was. She had that expected end. When she got down with dementia for a number of years and I was at home tied up with her, and that's where I should have been. But we both knew an expected end that when the day come, that if God took her home, he'd take her into his divine presence. Why? Because he, she had believed those vehicles of faults out of the heart of God and accepted his son as the Savior. So for 50-some years, she and I ministered together. Uh, she traveled with me. She worked in the church at home that I pastored. I pastored it for 44 years. And um, she worked alongside of me. She was half of me. And in that time when she got dementia, I would pray and I'd ask God. I'd say, God, take her home. Take her home. It got to a point where I begged him to take her home. Sometimes I got disappointed. Sometimes I got angry. I'm, I'm just telling you about what happens. But you know what? Through it all, I know the expected end. When I was saying, God, take her home, that was that expected end. So, to give you an expected end. Now, if you're here today and you know Christ, you have an expected end. You have an expected end that will let you live in peace in an evil world. Amen. You don't have to let this world control you. Absolutely not. Why? Because as long as you base your life upon these words, these vehicles of thought God took out of his heart and gave to you, you can have an expected end. This hope so, maybe so. I meet people all the time. They say, well, I hope so. Listen, God don't want you to hope so. He wants you to know so. Amen. So what are you saying here? All right, let me read you two verse scriptures. Jot them down. Psalm 68 and 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Great was the company of those that published it. In reality, it's pre preaching or presenting. Every one of us in here, have a, as a child of God, we have a work to be done, and that is to take these scriptures and present them when you're witness to your friend or your family or whoever it might be. Psalm 12 and 6 says, the words of the Lord are pure words. And then he goes on to say, as silver tried in a furnace seven times, purified seven times. Verse 7 says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. Amen. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Then, one, another thing here. Not only authority by the scriptures, but it's attended by the Spirit. These scriptures are attended by the Spirit. Today, when you, your eyes goes down and they lay on these scriptures, 
the Holy Spirit of God is there because he attends this word. Conviction comes, Holy Spirit of God attending these words. I believe that's all my heart. Second Peter 1 and 21, you'll know this one. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These are his messengers to mankind. God took these and he deposited in the holy men and they were just writing. He, they weren't putting down this on their own. They were nothing more than dictating. It's being dictated to them and they was writing it down. I believe that. Amen. Attended by the Spirit. Then 2 Timothy 3 and 16, you know this, and all scripture is given by inspiration and it, of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I like the last part of that for instruction in righteousness. So he's attending these. Now here's what he said in the beginning. I'll give you this as, a, as an illustration. Genesis 2 and 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam was nothing but he was dust. He was just dust. He was not animated at all. He, he had no life until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Follow me. When that happened, he became a living soul. Listen to what John 20 and 22 says. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Who are the disciples? Breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What did he get? The breath of life. Breath of life. I thank God that these scriptures are alive, and I thank God that when I read them or study them, they're attended, they're God's authority, but they're attended by the Holy Spirit. That's the reason he can take it and make it real to any of you in here. Anything that he wants to. And if it makes it real to you, you mark it down, it's by the Spirit of God, nothing else. All right? Now, I'm going to go to the third thing. Authority by the Scriptures, attended by the Spirit, and number three, accountability by the saved. All of us that are saved have an accountability. And one day we're going to give an account to Him. Can I say something to you? I'm not looking forward to that day. After he judges me and puts that aside and sets me over here for eternity, thank God for that. But my failures and shortcomings and all that, if I am repented of those, they're going to follow me. Accountability by the saved. Matthew chapter 28. You will be familiar with these. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. What do you say? First word, go. Go. I don't know of a church anywhere that could not hold more people. And I don't know of any place you go where they don't know, need to hear the gospel of Christ. It may be in your family. It may be your friends. It may even be your enemy. But they need the gospel. Go. That's our accountability. Chuck Trent, how well did you go? I don't want to answer that. <laughs> did you go? You understand? Then he says in Matthew 28 and 20, the next verse, teaching them. Teaching them. Watch. To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, Always, even unto the end of the world. Thank God. Amen. You don't travel alone. God said you'd never leave thee nor forsake thee. His presence is going to be with you and the potential for a good life is there as well. Amen. Never leave thee nor forsake thee. Going all the way to the end of the world. Your entire life as a child of God is bound up in the presence of God Almighty. The triune God Amen. going with you. Mark 16 and 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now listen. Every 
creature. It doesn't matter what color they are, nationality they are, age they are, educated, illiterate, it does not make any difference because God said that you are to go in all the world, that word go again, and preach the gospel to every creature. A pastor, he'll do his best, but it falls on us that we go out there and get them, bring them in. Amen? Amen. Now, when he said, go to Acts chapter 20. I want to see, show you this verse of scripture. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 27. Acts 20 and 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul's in. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the, there's the word again, counsel of God. Paul said, I'm giving you everything I've got. And even with that, you're never going to exhaust what's in this Bible. Right. Never going to happen. He'd been preaching here for years. And he'll preach probably till the day he dies, unless something happens where he can't. But I'd say he will. What's he saying? This will never be exhausted. Amen. I had a man tell me one time, he said, I reckon I've heard every sermon ever was. I thought, I ought to back off away from you and not talk to you no more. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be your pastor, and maybe I shouldn't be preaching to you. Oh, he was like this. <laughs> I don't like that to start with, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> Counsel. He has a determined purpose. He's got a will. He's got a design. He's got a plan. All right here in this book. Everything you need to know for life in him is in this book. And that doesn't cover everything. Can I give you one thought? When we talk about heaven, God's abode, it is an unlimited domain of God. Unlimited. Nothing that he cannot do. Nothing he cannot do. What's impossible with man is possible with God. That's scripture. But it's an unlimited domain. Lord, can you help me with this? Yeah, you can. Lord, can you do this? Can you give me that? Guess what? He can. He can. It's unlimited. Now I'm going to read you these scriptures. After we've looked at the authority by the scriptures, attended by the spirit, and accountability by the saved. Now listen to these. You jot them down. Jeremiah 23, verse 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. It's going to happen. It does not matter what man does, it's going to happen. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. In the latter days, guess where we're at? Guess where we're at? Well, he said you will consider it Perfectly. I need to put a little more effort into that one. But here's Psalm 139, verse 17. That's a great chapter. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. He, he said a moment ago, he's, he's not out to give us evil. He's out to give us peace. Did I hear an amen? amen? Now, it would have been real easy for me to, back in May... After being in with my wife for all those years, and during that time lost about 50 pounds, and during that time went down physically, and then he took her home. But it'd been easy for me to stop, quit, hang it up. I Six years of youth work, 44 years of pastoring, 50-some years of ministry, me and my wife had done, it had been easy. I said, Lord, I quit. We served you 50-some years. You let her get dementia, and you've taken her into a state now that I do not even recognize anymore. I've asked you to take her home. You wouldn't take her home. I'm disappointed. I'm angry. I'm hurt. After all that we have, quote, quote, done, don't matter. I quit. Then 
in October a year ago, from this past October a year ago, I fell and broke the femur in my leg there. Put a plate and eight pins in it. God, I'm finished. I'm done. I'm not going any further. Nope. I'd had reason, but not a good reason. So what happened, preacher? I went into evangelism. I done retired from my church and gave it up during that time. I went into evangelism. It'd been easy to give up. Age, circumstances, situations, doesn't matter. It would be easy to give up. But God does not want you to give up. If he goes with you all the way to the end of the earth, don't you think you'd go with him too? Amen. So if you're able, you may have to change things. I changed from a I still got a pastor's heart. But you got to change from a from a uh, previous service for God and, and adjust it to a new one for him. Are you all with me? And if that's what it takes to serve him, then do it. It may get you down to where you can't go much anymore. I'm going to tell you one thing we need in our church is a good prayer warriors. You give me, a, you give me some people that are prayer warriors that will take me to the throne of grace, my church to the throne of grace, and pray about meetings and all these things and things that are helping. That, that lady back there took a fall. Pray for her. He read a list this morning. Pray for her. As long as you've got a mouth, you can pray. But we're dealing with the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Let me give you another one. Many, O Lord, this is Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. My, my, my. Last scripture, Psalm 107, verse 11. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High, in other words, they despised it. They were down where they would neglect it. They'd scorn it. They would reject, reject it. It implies hatred, some, sometimes anger. And that's what they're doing out there. That's the reason they want to make it as hard as they can on your church. They want to make it as hard as they can on you as a child of God. We've been in battle ever since the beginning. Satan will, will see to that battle. But I got news for you. He loses. He is already marked in the counsel of God. He's lost. He's done. He's fin His day's coming. So thank God and the Lamb forever. What do you say, preacher? I'm saying this. As long as God gives me breath, I'm going with this. And the next message we preach this morning, I hope will solidify some of that a little bit more. But my message for this hour has been uh, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You're all very attentive. I appreciate that. Brother Jerry. Thank you, Brother. Thank Chuck. you, Brother. Let me just say this. I don't remember a whole lot that Brother Chuck has preached in years, but one sermon stands out, and I know you'll remember it. He preached a message years and years and years and years and years and years <laughs> ago, <laughs> and the message was concerning the Word of God. And it was entitled, Don't Mess With My Portrait. I never will forget that. Never will forget that. Thank you, Brother Chuck. Appreciate the message. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this message. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would hear more of the same. We ask, dear God, that you would just bless us. The singers come in just a little bit. Brother Chuck comes back and preaches for us. Just give us a good day. We need you. We need the Word of God in this old crazy world in which we live we pray heavenly father that uh, someone will trust christ this morning in this amen. service in jesus name we pray amen amen nobody God bless you. loves me like you love me jesus i stand in all of your amazing way i worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. 
Nobody.